Well, thanks very much, uh, Deacon. It's um, always hard to, you know, follow Martin Luther King Jr. You know, speaking at the the podium. <laughs> and my my uh, oratorical style is is uh, somewhat uh, more subdued, uh, as you know. And that's not a very good thing after people have just eaten dinner, too. <laughs> but it's it's great to be uh, with you here. Let me just advance my slide if I know where. There we go. It's wonderful to, to be here with you, and I'm going to uh, talk with you about uh, about the, the case for creation. Uh, but before I uh, do that, I'm uh, I'm a professor at Lehigh University, but I always uh, start because the things I'm going to talk about are so controversial, I always start with a disclaimer that I, if, if you were under the impression that I was speaking officially for Lehigh University, that's not correct. Uh, my colleagues, most of them disagree with me. Uh, my mother thinks I'm wrong. Uh, uh, so this is, this is just me talking. So tonight, uh, there are going to be two broad areas that I'm going to address. The first one uh, is the following, that some biological systems at the molecular level strongly appear to be the result of deliberate intelligent design. And the second point then is that Darwin's theory of evolution by random mutation and natural selection, which is the dominant view in the biological community, is utterly incompatible with the theory of purposeful intelligent design. So one can have uh, the one without the other. So let's start with that first uh, topic, that some biological systems strongly appear to be deliberately designed. And I know this is the antiquity portion of the curriculum for the Institute. And not only is creation about as antique as you can get, uh, but <coughs> the discussion and the controversy about creation is also uh, dates from antiquity. Here's the cover of a book written about 10 years ago by a professor at Cambridge University called Creationism and its Critics in Antiquity. And uh, the blurb says that the world is configured in ways that seem systematically hospitable to life forms, especially the human race. Is this the outcome of divine planning or simply of the laws of physics? Ancient Greeks and Romans famously disagreed on whether the cosmos was the product of design or accident. So these issues have been chewed over for thousands of years. Uh, but it turns out that the ancient Greeks and Romans, while they addressed the issues, they were at a disadvantage because if you want to um, decide whether nature or the products of nature are designed or not, you need to know what they are. You need to have to have a good understanding of nature and what exists and, and what doesn't. So the argument about uh, design, creation, uh, depends on our understanding of science. The more and more we know about nature, the more and more we can be confident in our decisions. And uh, the case for purposeful design uh, of life and, and nature uh, reached its zenith before Darwin uh, with the writings of this man, his name William Paley. He was an Anglican clergyman in the early 1800s and wrote a book uh, in which he examined nature and made a strong case that it was indeed designed. His most famous uh, passage was that if you stumbled across a watch when you were walking across a meadow, you'd immediately know that it was designed because you would see that the parts were all fashioned for each other and for the purpose of, of keeping time. And this was a very popular, very influential and persuasive book for probably 50 years. And historians say that Charles Darwin read it when he was a college student, like almost all college students of his day, and was very impressed by it. 
But William Paley's argument was not only for design in nature, not only that life and, and the world show features of design, but it was also that the designer was a beneficent, omnipotent, good God. And later on, in 1859, when uh, Charles Darwin published his famous book on the origin of species, proposing that, in fact, life developed by random variations plus natural selection, um, he took issue with, with not only with the, uh, he did not only offer a, an idea about how life might develop, but he argued against Paley's argument that, in fact, nature reflects a good God. Because if nature contains things like malarial parasites and snakes and lions that eat you, then maybe this designer isn't such a good person. And Darwin made this explicit in a letter that he wrote to an American biologist, a friend of his named Asa Gray, uh, about a year after his book first came out. And in the letter, there's a passage he writes that, I cannot persuade myself that a beneficent and omnipotent God would have designedly created the ichneumonidae, which are wasps, uh, with the express intention of their feeding within the living bodies of caterpillars, which they, their grub do, or that a cat should play with mice. Not believing this, I see no necessity in the belief that the eye was expressly designed. So Paley's argument was that was for both design and benevolence. And so Darwin saying, well, I don't see the benevolence. Therefore, there is no design. So the modern, now we'll, let's uh, fast forward another 150 years. The modern argument for design is distinguished from Paley's. He got a lot of things correct. If you went across a meadow, you certainly, uh, upon stepping on a watch, would conclude that it was designed, especially for the, exactly for the reasons that, that he said. But the modern design argument separates those two different questions. Does nature show uh, signs of design? And what is the nature of this designer? The first one is a scientific question. We can look and see what nature does. We know what, uh, how to detect design. The second question is a philosophical, theological question. So in my talk, I'm going to stick to the question of signs of design. The nice thing about this approach is that, in my view, it insulates the argument for design against objections like Darwin raised. Maybe the designer is evil. Maybe the designer is you know, not all that competent. But was there a designer? And I think philosophy and theology, of which I am uh, utterly ignorant, or maybe not utterly, but pretty close, uh, can address those second questions. And um, so the modern design argument follows the same path that uh, Isaac Newton followed when he proposed his theory of gravity uh, in, in the 1600s. At that time, scientists thought that two bodies couldn't attract unless they hit, or couldn't interact unless they hit each other. They thought that bodies attracting through space was some kind of spooky idea, uh, reminiscent of ancient, you know, ancient um, ideas of angels moving planets around. Uh, and when they asked Isaac Newton, well, okay, you've got this theory and it predicts a lot of things and it works, but what is the mechanism of gravity? How does it work? And he famously said, hypothesis non fingo. As you all know, <laughs> since you're here at this uh, Institute of Catholic Culture, that means I offer no hypothesis. 
I'll leave that for the future. Let somebody else worry about that. Well, I'm going to do the same thing with the question about the identity of the designer and the nature of the designer. I'll let uh, Deacon, uh, Deacon address those, uh, those questions and, and other folks. Of course, we clearly realize that a scientific theory of design could have you know, theological, philosophical implications, but that's not unusual. Lots of scientific theories that address basic questions have such implications. And just before I start on the first part of my talk, uh, let me say that one such theory is the Big Bang Theory. Uh, you might forget that before the Big Bang Theory was proposed in the middle uh, 20th century, most physicists thought that the universe was eternal and unchanging. But then the motions of galaxies away from the Earth and away from each other were noticed and, and this gave rise to the idea that maybe in the past they were closer and maybe in the distant past they were all together and maybe that's when time began. And this, you know, sounded suspiciously like a creation event. And uh, it, uh, a lot of people, you know, saw that it had philosophical implications and a lot of them didn't like it including a lot of scientists, a lot of physicists. For example, in uh, 25 years ago, in 1989, a man named John Maddox, who was the editor of the journal Nature, which is the most prominent science journal in the world, wrote a peculiar editorial entitled, Down with the Big Bang. And he wrote in it, he said, apart from being philosophically unacceptable, the Big Bang is an oversimple view of, the, uh, of how the universe began and is unlikely to survive the decade ahead, he said 25 years ago. <laughs> creationists, creationists seeking support for their opinions have ample justification in the doctrine of the Big Bang. So, <laughs> Scientific theories can have theolo and philosophical, even theological implications, but and that does not make the theory itself uh, non-scientific. The Big Bang theory is a completely scientific theory, might have implications for other uh, for other intellectual realms, um, but uh, that doesn't make it unscientific. And I'm claiming the same thing for a theory of intelligent design, as I'll explain uh, throughout the talk. Okay, so my, uh, the talk it, uh, concerns, you know, how, what is the structure of the modern intelligent design argument? And the structure I'm going to uh, present tonight is a lot like the one I wrote about in an op-ed piece about 10 years or so ago for the New York Times called Design for Living. Um, it wasn't really a uh, front page uh, story. Uh. <laughs> Should have been, I guess, but but with uh, with computers, you can do wonderful things these days. Um, and uh, it, there was a, an evolution teaching controversy in the state of Kansas, and the Times wanted somebody to explain what intelligent design was for their readers. Uh, and so, if if you can explain your ideas in an op-ed piece, you know they're really not all that hard to understand. And the argument is going to have five. Uh, five different points. I'll run through them and then we'll go through one, each one one by one. The first point of my argument is that design is not some mystical conclusion. You don't have to close your eyes and raise your hands in order to see design. Rather, it's deduced from the physical structure of the system. The second point is that looking at that physical structure, everyone agrees. Everyone agrees that aspects of biology appear to be designed. And when I say everyone, I mean even those folks who are most adamantly opposed to the reality of design. Even they say that, boy, it sure looks that way. And people like that generally say that, well, it looks designed, but we have another explanation other than actual design. And the leading candidate is Darwinian, the Darwinian mechanism of evolution. Uh, 
And so the third point of my talk will be to show you that there are structural obstacles to Darwinian evolution. That is, there are physical reasons to think that it cannot do what its advocates claim for it. But you might say, you know, every time we look at a science program on television or, or read a, a magazine and, or read a science magazine uh, on, on, on life on Earth, we're told that science has already shown that Darwinian processes can explain all of life. You know, that's old news. So my next point is that those grand Darwinian claims rest on undisciplined imagination. Okay to be polite. <laughs> and the last point then is a summary point. It's this, that the bottom line is in two, the year 2015, we have strong positive evidence for design, but little evidence uh, to support Darwinian claims. So let's start with that first point, that design is not mystical. It's deduced from the uh, physical uh, physical arrangement uh, uh, of a uh, physical structure of a system. Before we do that, though, let's ask ourselves, what do we mean by intelligent design? What what the heck is this? Well, if you look up the word design in a dictionary, uh, you'll see a number of different definitions. But the pertinent one is the following: that design is the purposeful or inventive arrangement of parts or details. And that means that we infer design, we conclude design has happened whenever we see parts that appear to have been arranged to accomplish a function. Well, that's a, that's a bunch of words. And oftentimes, it's, it's easier to see a concept when you look at an example. So uh, let's look at, at such a thing on the next uh, slide here. <laughs> you know, I don't know if everybody in the room can see it, so let's go through. This is a far side cartoon, and we've got a troop of jungle explorers here, and the lead explorer has been strung up and skewered. And this fellow here turns to this guy here and says, that's why I never walk in front. <laughs> Words to live by, let me assure you. <laughs> Now, everybody in this room looks at this cartoon, and you immediately realize this was designed. This was not an accident. His death was intended. As a matter of fact, the humor of the cartoon depends upon you recognizing the design. It wouldn't be all that funny if you just fell over a cliff or something. But how do you do that? How, how do you know that, that this was designed? Is it a religious conclusion? Unless you have a strange religion, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know it's designed because you see a number of different parts that have been arranged to accomplish a function. You see the purposeful arrangement of parts. So this is really not all that difficult. If, if you can illustrate your main point with a far side cartoon, uh, this is not quantum physics here. Now there's one other point that we have to keep in mind so we don't get confused about uh, recognizing design. And that is that the strength of the design inference is quantitative. And by that I mean that the more and more parts you have, and the more and more precisely they are arranged to accomplish the function, then the more and more and more confident you can be in the conclusion of design. And let's look at, at let's try to illustrate that. First of all, suppose um, you and a friend went out for a walk, and you were walking a mile, uh, a, along, and you saw these mountains uh, ahead of you, the Sawtooth Mountains in Idaho. And he turned to you and asked you, where do you think those mountains came from? And you would say, well, I never did take that geology course. Um, plate tectonics or volcanic activity or 
and most people would be satisfied with that. But suppose you and your friend kept on walking and you were really avid hikers and you walked by this mountain called Old Man of the Mountain in New Hampshire. And this is a landmark in New Hampshire and, and this was actually unstable and was, uh, was uh, looking like it would fall down. These people up here are wor state workers trying to stabilize it. And of course they're state workers so it fell down. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> oh, that was a joke. <laughs> and you, you might say in response to your friend's question, you know, hey, look at this. This kind of looks like a chin here, and this is a little mouth, and maybe a nose here, and a, a forehead. Do you think some Paleolithic tribe, you know, might have say no nah, no nah, no nah. that's that's silly you know this is probably this is just a, a coincidence you know if you look at look at this uh, mountain from the other side it doesn't look like much of a much it, it's interesting but you know it's it's uh, uh, just a coincidence but you and your friend kept on walking and you came by this mountain <laughs> And he asked the same question. How do you think these got there? Now you would never think to say plate tectonics or volcanic activity. You can see by the purposeful arrangement of the rocks, the purpose being to portray the images of the presidents of the United States, uh, that these are in fact the result of intelligent design. Other parts of the mountain might have different explanations, but certainly this part uh, is easily uh, seen as the result of intelligent design. Okay, so that was the first point that I was going to make, that design is not some mystical conclusion. It's deduced from the physical structure of a system. We deduce design every day. So let's move on to the second point. Everyone agrees that aspects of biology appear to uh, be designed. And again, when I see everyone, I mean everyone, including those who most strongly oppose real design. And uh, I can't go through everyone, so uh, to exemplify uh, this point, uh, I'll uh, quote a man named Richard Dawkins, who you may have heard of. He's a retired professor of biology from Oxford University in English, England, and a, a very strong supporter of Darwin's theory of evolution, also a very strong public atheist who's uh, uh, been in the news over the past number of years. And in 1986, he wrote uh, a very popular book of his called The Blind Watchmaker, which was a strong defense of Darwin's theory. Nonetheless, on the very first page, of the very first chapter of his book, Richard Dawkins wrote that biology is the study of complicated things that give the appearance of having been designed for a purpose. That's the very definition of biology, says Richard Dawkins. The study of things that uh, appear to have been designed for a purpose. Why does he think they look like they were designed for a purpose? He doesn't think they were. He doesn't think they actually were designed for a purpose. So why does he think many things in biology even look like they were designed for a purpose? Is it maybe for some uh, aesthetic reason? You know, maybe because uh, flowers are so pretty or you know, uh, baby lambs are, are so cute. But no, uh, it's not for aesthetic reasons that Richard Dawkins thinks uh, these things look designed. It's for engineering reasons. He goes on to write, we may say that a living body or organ is well designed if it has attributes that an intelligent and knowledgeable engineer might have built into it in order to achieve some sensible purpose, such as flying, swimming, seeing. Any engineer can recognize an object that has been designed, even poorly designed for a purpose. And he can usually work out what that purpose is just by looking at the structure of the object. So what is he saying? He's saying that we recognize design in the purposeful arrangement of parts. 
and that biology has this property suffused uh, throughout it. Well, is, is this appearance of design according to Richard Dawkins, is, is it kind of like seeing the old man in the mountain? Or is it like seeing faces in the clouds or something, you know, something ephemeral and intriguing, but, you know, just, just, uh, just passing? Well, no. Uh, according to himself, the appearance of design in life is overpowering. He writes, natural selection is the blind watchmaker. Blind because it does not see ahead, after all, he's a Darwinist, does not plan consequences, has no purpose in view. Yet, the living results of natural selection overwhelmingly impress us with the appearance of design, as if by a master watchmaker, impress us with the illusion of design and planning. So again, this is, this is no, uh, you know, uh, this is no old man of the mountain. These are overpowering appearances of design, like seeing the, the, uh, the watch in the meadow. Okay, so that, that was the point that everyone agrees that aspects of biology appear to be designed. Nonetheless, of course, Richard Dawkins does not think that biological systems really were designed. He thinks that Darwinian processes uh, are capable of explaining them without actual design. So let's go to the next point then, and that is to, to show you that there are structural obstacles to Darwinian evolution. There are physical reasons to think that it cannot do uh, what is claimed for it. And there's lots and lots of, of problems in, for Darwin's theory. But one of them, uh, a prominent one of them, is one I wrote about uh, in a book uh, near coming up on 20 years ago now. Uh, and it focuses on a problem that Darwin himself pointed out in his book, The Origin of Species. Uh, in The Origin of Species, Darwin wrote a section called Organs of Extreme Perfection and Complication where he was, think, he was talking about the, the vertebrate eye and other uh, very sophisticated systems. And he wrote, if it could be demonstrated that any complex organ existed which could not possibly have been formed by numerous successive slight modifications, my theory would absolutely break down. Adding, but I can find out no such case. Now in this passage, Darwin was emphasizing that his was a gradual theory, that evolution had to proceed slowly in tiny steps over long periods of time. Because he knew if life improved quickly in big leaps, then it would look suspiciously as if something other than random mutations were involved. So let's take Darwin at his word and ask ourselves, well, what sorts of systems sure don't look like they could be produced by numerous successive slight modifications? Well, uh, systems that uh, fit that, that requirement are ones that I term irreducibly complex or have the property of irreducible complexity. Now, irreducible complexity is a, is a fancy phrase uh, and I made it up to make people think I was smart. Uh, <laughs> hasn't worked yet. Um, but it stands for a simple idea. It just means that you've got some organ or machine or system that has a number of different parts. And all of the parts have to interact with each other to produce a function that couldn't have been produced by itself. And if you take away one of them, then the system breaks down. And again, that's a bunch of words, so let's look at an example of what I mean uh, by that from, from our everyday life, not from biology yet. And one that fits the bill is, is shown here. And this is just a plain old ordinary mechanical mousetrap that you might get at a hardware store. And a mousetrap has a number of different parts. It's got a big wooden platform to which all the other parts are attached. It's got this tightly wound spring with an extended end here and another extended end that hooks over this other metal part, which is called the hammer, which actually squashes the mouse. And you have to push the hammer over 
to get it in position, uh, and it has to be stabilized there, and that's the job of something called the holding bar, and the end of the holding bar has to be stabilized by inserting it into the catch. Now the mousetrap needs all these parts to work. If it were missing the spring or the hammer or the catch, you would not have a trap that worked half as well as it used to, or a quarter as well as it used to. You would have a broken mousetrap. It would not work at all. So this is what I mean by irreducibly complex. <coughs> Turns out that irreducibly complex systems are real hard to envision being produced by the gradual process that Darwin required for, for his evolutionary uh, mechanism. I mean, if you wanted to uh, produce uh, something like a mousetrap by something like a Darwinian evolutionary process, you know, how would you do that? You know, where would you start? You know, would, maybe we would start with just the platform and hope to catch mice inefficiently. <laughs> you know, maybe trip them as they ran over the, the platform. And then, then maybe you could improve it. Maybe you could add another piece, maybe the, the holding bar. And, and maybe then when they tripped, they could impale themselves on the end of the holding bar. No, nah, that's silly. It can't work like that. Because with irreducibly complex systems, the function only appears when the system has essentially been put together. That's a big problem for Darwinian theory, because natural selection then has nothing to select until you finish the system. And if you finish the system, then you don't need, need it uh, anymore in, in any event. Well, mousetraps are, are very interesting. I think about them a lot. Uh, but what we really want to know is, are there any irreducibly complex biological systems? You know, uh, cellular systems. Or now that science has shown that the real foundational level of life are cells and molecules, are there any such irreducibly complex biochemical systems? And the answer is, yeah, they're all over the place. You can't open up a biochemistry textbook without encountering uh, such things. And uh, my favorite visual example uh, of irreducible complexity at the molecular level is something called the bacterial flagellum, which is quite literally an outboard motor that bacteria use to swim. It's got a number of parts. This part over here acts as the propeller. It's kind of a whip-like propeller. And it's spun around and around and around. And as it spins around, it pushes against the water. Uh, and that pushes the bacterium forward. And the propeller is, hooked, or is attached to the drive shaft by something called the hook region, which acts as a universal joint, uh, allowing the, the transmission of rotation in this plane to the plane of the uh, propeller. The uh, drive shaft itself is attached to uh, the motor, which uses a flow of acid from the outside of the cell to the inside to power its turning, kind of like water flowing over a dam can turn a turbine. The whole thing has to be kept in place, uh, and a number of parts, protein parts of the uh, apparatus act as a stator material, just like uh, clamps and screws will keep a, an outboard motor on a boat in our everyday world. Uh, other parts of the structure act as bushing material, allowing the drive shaft to pass through the bacterial membrane and, and not leak. And there are many other parts that, that I uh, can't talk about right now. And I know this, this looks complex, but let me assure you this is just a little cartoon image of this uh, machine, and that it has to have many other parts and many other features that we don't have time to talk about in order to actually work. Now I like to show people this picture of a flagellum, which is taken from a popular uh, college biochemistry textbook, because most people, when they look at it, quickly realize that this is a machine. 
This is not like a machine. This is not analogous to a machine. This is a real molecular machine. And maybe our knowledge of where machines come from can aid us in trying to figure out where this thing may have come from, too. Another thing I'd like to point out is that perhaps you can see that the flagellum, like a mousetrap, is irreducibly complex. Take away the propeller, take away the drive shaft, the universal joint, uh, any of the parts of the, of the structure, and you don't get a flagellum that spins half as fast as it used to, or a quarter as fast as it used to. You have a broken flagellum. Or, much more likely, you don't get a flagellum at all, because in addition to this, the cell has sophisticated feedback mechanisms to monitor the construction of this machine. And it will shut down construction to save energy if it senses that uh, things are not going well. So like the mousetrap, the flagellum is irreducibly complex. And, and much like it, it's, uh, it's evolutionary uh, construction by numerous successive slight modifications randomly uh, in a Darwinian sense is very difficult to envision. Well, is the flagellum some freak of nature? Is it something, whoa, that's there, and, but you know, pretty much nothing else is, is like it? Well, no. It, it turns out that almost everything at the molecular level in the cell is like this. The big story of 20th century biology is the discovery that our lives are based on machines. Just kind of like anybody, anybody here ever watch uh, a, a TV show called um, Star Trek? Mm. <laughs> uh, yeah, there are a few. And in one of the later incarnations, there was a race of beings called the Borg, you may remember. And the Borg were run by nanotechnology. They had these little machines in them. Well, believe it or not, in that sense, we are the Borg. We are run by little machines. Our physical bodies are run uh, by tiny, very sophisticated machines. Um, <clears throat> but no, this is not, this is not uh, the only example. Uh, for, for example, here's a cover of a, uh, the journal Cell, which is a professional biology journal from the late 1990s, a special issue on macromolecular machines. And if you turn the page and look at the table of contents, you see articles with titles such as, The Cell is a Collection of Protein Machines, Polymerases in the Replisome, Machines Within Machines, Mechanical devices of the spliceosome, motors, clocks, springs, and things. Let me go back to that cover. And if you look at it closely, on the lower left, you'll see something that looks a lot like William Paley's watch, which has been discovered in the cell. So that was the point that there are structural obstacles to Darwinian evolution. There are physical reasons to thinking that, uh, it, that the theory cannot explain what its proponents claim for it. So the next point is that those grand Darwinian claims, not little Darwinian claims, I want to emphasize that Darwinian process can explain some things, and I don't have time to talk about that tonight, but those grand Darwinian claims that it can account for the basis of life rest on undisciplined imagination. And there's a lot of uh, people you could cite to support that point. But what I'm going to, to show you is one by a, a man named Franklin Harold, who is now an emeritus professor of microbiology uh, from the uh, Colorado State University. And in the early 2000s, he wrote a book called The Way of the Cell, which was published by Oxford University Press, a very prestigious uh, academic publishing house. And in it, he talked about trying to explain the molecular basis of life. And at one point, he uh, discussed the topic of intelligent design. And he had this to say about it. He said, we should reject, as a matter of principle, 
the substitution of intelligent design for the dialogue of chance and necessity. And he cited my book. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. But we must concede that there are presently no detailed Darwinian accounts of the evolution of any biochemical system, only a variety of wishful speculations. Yeah. Well, that's interesting. Well, um, Professor Harold makes two points here, and uh, I'd like to dwell on them for a minute uh, and take them kind of in reverse order. First of all, he says that there are no Darwinian accounts uh, for the evolution of a biochemical system, only a variety of wishful speculations. Wishful speculations, you know, in more colloquial language, those are called uh, just so stories. <laughs> I'm sure you've heard them, you know, the stories, uh, children's stories written by Rudyard Kipling over a hundred years ago. Like what? Uh, uh, how the tiger got its stripes, how the rhinoceros got its horn, how the bacterium got its flagellum. You know, all those famous uh, just so stories. You know, it's funny, you know, when you think about it, but if you think about it a little more, it's really astounding that a theory that has been so utterly fruitless at explaining the foundation of life is nonetheless uh, adhered to by a majority uh, of, the, of the biological community. And it makes you think that perhaps a new idea might be called for. And the second point that Professor Harold made, or the, his first point, was that we should reject intelligent design on principle. On principle, we should reject it. What principle? What principle is that? You know, we, you look at that drawing of a flagellum I showed you a, a little, a few slides ago. Design is something that jumps off the page at you. And yet apparently we are forbidden to entertain the idea of design based on principle. Well, what is that? Well, it turns out he doesn't say. He just writes what I showed here on the board, or on the a slide, and then goes on to other topics. Nonetheless, I think I have a good idea uh, what, his, uh, what the principle is that, that he's thinking of, and it's shown on, on the next slide here. <laughs> <laughs> and it is this, that intelligent design seems to point strongly beyond nature. It seems to have philosophical, maybe even theological implications. And he thinks that science should stay far apart, far away from uh, things that have such strong extra scientific implications. Well, I understand his point, but, but I disagree. When I was being trained as a scientist, we were always taught that science is supposed to follow the evidence wherever it leads. Let other people worry about uh, philosophical or other implications. And I thought that was a good idea back then, and I continue to, to think so. OK, so that was the uh, topic, or the point that grand Darwinian claims rest on undisciplined imagination. So the bottom line is that right now, in the present, 2015, we have in hand strong evidence for design, but little evidence uh, that Darwinian processes uh, really work as they're touted to. And you might say to yourself, well, okay, we just saw Franklin Harold's stuff uh, that, uh, that you know, we have no Darwinian explanations, but remind me again, what is this strong, positive evidence for design? And it is exactly what Richard Dawkins says that it is. It's that Life overwhelmingly impresses us with the appearance of design, as if by a master watchmaker. That is how we recognize design in the purposeful arrangement of parts. That is the evidence for design. Whenever we see it, 
uh, in traps in the jungle, in Mount Rushmore, we always recognize design. We don't ask for further evidence. We say that is the evidence of design. Well, what kind of a, an argument is that? That you say that, well, whenever we see a uh, purposeful arrangement of parts here, we've always concluded that it was the result of design. Now, unexpectedly, we found strong uh, purposeful arrangements of parts in life itself. And so we are also justified there in concluding design has occurred. Well, uh, the argument uh, is uh, colloquially can, can be kind of exemplified by the next slide. And what is that? It's, it's a duck, yeah. Because if it looks like a duck, and if it walks like a duck, and if it quacks like a duck, then we are justified, intellectually justified, in concluding that that is a duck. Now, like I said, that's the colloquial version of the argument. But philosophers know that, in fact, that sort of reasoning is just one of the two major roads or modes of reasoning that we use to draw conclusions all the time. And they've actually got a technical name for it. Uh, they call it a, an inductive uh, <laughs> argument. <laughs> you see. <laughs> That's what they call it. Uh, <laughs> Okay, well, inductive argument, you know, philosophers. Are, are we talking philosophy or, or what? Well, it turns out if you look up the phrase inductive reasoning in, say, uh, reference works, you'll find something like this. Inductive reasoning. When a person uses a number of established facts to draw a general conclusion, he uses inductive reasoning. This is the kind of logic normally used in the sciences. The argument for intelligent design is a scientific argument. It's not a philosophical argument, except to the extent that all arguments are philosophical. It, de it depends on the empirical evidence, plus normal modes of reasoning, inductive reasoning, that science uses all the time. So the conclusion is that an intelligent design is rationally justified. So let's switch over to the second point that Darwin's theory of evolution by random mutation and natural selection, the dominant view, is utterly incompatible with a theory of purposeful intelligent design. And I'm focusing on this because many well-meaning Christian scientists who are Christian uh, try to reconcile the two. They say that, well, you know, we, you know, this is not a problem for the Christian faith that it's easily compatible. And I'm going to take the opposite view, that in fact it's, it's utterly, utterly incompatible. Um, and it, uh, much of this turns on the ambiguous um, uh, definition of the word evolution. Whenever you discuss topics like this, you always have to define your terms. And often the idea of evolution is confused. People uh, confuse a simple idea that organisms that are alive today have descended by birth and death from organisms that were alive in the, in the misty past. And they confuse that with Darwin's particular mechanism of evolution. That, in fact, this occurred by utterly random processes plus natural selection. And a person who saw the difference between those two, between what we might say generic evolution with the mechanism unspecified and Darwin's particular theory, uh, was a man named uh, Cardinal Christoph Schoenborn, who 10 years ago wrote an op-ed piece in the New York Times uh, 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 in the same year that I did. And he wrote the following. He said, evolution in the sense of common ancestry might be true, but evolution in the neo-Darwinian sense, an unguided, unplanned process of random variation and natural selection is not. Any system of thought that denies or seeks to explain away the overwhelming evidence for design in biology is ideology, uh, not science. The first sense of evolution, just that 
organisms are descended from each other is, you know, interesting, but by itself, without the uh, topic of how that might happen, what is the mechanism of evolution, does not really have any strong philosophical or theological implications. And an, another person who, who saw that is, in fact, um, uh, another cardinal named Joseph Ratzinger, who wrote a book uh, about 30 years or so ago called In the Beginning, A Catholic Understanding of the Story of Creation and the Fall. And in it, he wrote the following. He says, it is the affair of the natural sciences to explain how the tree of life in particular continues to grow and how new branches shoot out from it. This is not a matter for faith. So, you know, new species, you know, uh, changes, you know, occurring over time, that's, that's no big deal. You know, let's not sweat the small stuff. But he goes on to say, to, to discuss the important question, what is the mechanism of evolution? What's going on here? And he writes, let us go directly to the question of evolution and its mechanisms. Microbiology and biochemistry have brought revolutionary insights here. They have brought us to the awareness that an organism and a machine have many points in common. Their functioning presupposes a precisely thought through and therefore reasonable design. And he, go, he, he goes on, he says, we must have the audacity to say that the great projects of the living creation are not the products of chance and error. They point to a creating reason and show us a creating intelligence, and they do so more luminously and radiantly today than ever before. So let's take a second to look at the three points that uh, Cardinal Ratzinger, the, the uh, later uh, Pope Benedict XVI, made. He says the following, that life is designed, it is precisely thought through. That is the great projects of the living creation. There is physical evidence for the design. The great projects of the living creation which point to a creating reason. Looking at them, we see the creating reason. And that the science of biochemistry has brought revolutionary insights here. It has brought new physical evidence to the table so that the design argument uh, moves forward. Uh, it, it, as I said, it depends on our state of knowledge of the science. So Cardinal Ratzinger says that, in fact, we can tell by the physical evidence that life is designed. Uh, and uh, I want to uh, make a, a, a brief argument against some, <laughs> some uh, uh, other points of view about evolution and our faith. Uh, um, people who are, are more anxious to, uh, to uh, fit uh, uh, modern day science uh, into it. And uh, in particular, uh, a good friend of mine, uh, a man named Steve Barr, who actually spoke here about five months ago, uh, He's a physicist at the University of Delaware and a, a splendid writer and uh, has written for First Things for many years. But he took issue with uh, Cardinal Schoenborn's letter to the New York Times and he said that essentially it was inflaming hostility between science and religion. He is saying that the words that the Cardinal used, unguided and unplanned, in fact, when scientists are actually doing science, they do not use the words unguided, un unplanned, uh, said Steve. He said the word random is used in science, uh, and it does not mean uncaused, unplanned, or inexplicable. It just means uncorrelated. So he's saying in a technical sense, what scientists really mean is that events are random, that they are not correlated with the good of an organism, they don't use these theologically charged words of unguided and unplanned. And uh, I, I sympathize with his argument, but I think it's, it's completely uh, mistaken. Uh, for a couple of reasons, and we'll see three minutes uh, how many reasons I can get in. 
But the first reason is that scientists do indeed mean that evolution proceeds in a way that is unguided and unplanned. And one can see this in documents written by prominent scientists and their organizations themselves. For example, in 1995, there was another evolution controversy in Kansas. And the National Association of Biology Teachers weighed in on it. And they decided to tell, uh, uh, make it clear what they meant by evolution. And they wrote that the diversity of life on Earth is the outcome of em evolution. An unsupervised, impersonal, unpredictable, and natural process of temporal descent with genetic modification. Now, it does not take you know, a lot to figure out who they were trying to exclude with the words unsupervised and impersonal. Ten years later, <coughs> in response to uh, in response to another Kansas dust-up, a group of Nobel laureates sent a letter to the Kansas Board of Education, which they also had printed in the New York Times. And they defined evolution in the following manner. They said, evolution is understood to be the result of an unguided, unplanned process of random variation and natural selection. Now, if you'll remember, that is the exact phrasing that Cardinal Schoenborn used in his op-ed piece. And this is signed by Richard Axel, Nobel Prize in Medicine, 2004. <laughs> Linda Buck, Medicine, 2004. Gunnar Blobel, 1999. Aaron Chechenover, 2004. Robert Carl, uh, 1996. Uh, and 35 other Nobel Prize laureates. Now, if the scientific community, as represented by such prominent uh, people as these, say that by the word Darwinian evolution, they mean unsupervised, unplanned, unguided, then that's what Darwinian evolution means. We are not free to define things in our own private way, uh, in a way that is not used by the people who use it most often. So I think it's clear that no consistent Christian can believe in Darwinian evolution. But let me just close by uh, saying that uh, uh, Pope Benedict XVI uh, had it exactly correct when he wrote that we indeed must have the audacities to say that the great projects of the living creation are not the products of chance and error. They point to a creating reason and show us a creating intelligence, and they do so more luminously and radiantly today than ever before. And thanks very much for your attention. In light of this strong evidence, why are there so many scientists still on the other side? Uh, well, it's kind of it's philosophical that uh, many scientists think that in fact, science has to explain the material world by material causes. And if you start with that assumption, then you'll never see design. And I've talked to scientists who say that, and I say explicitly to them, yeah, well, if you have that presumption, you won't, even if design is there, you won't see it. And they'll say, yes, that's right. And, uh, and also, there's been a lot of conflict between various religious groups uh, and science on, on peripheral issues, uh, and that's colored things, and p oftentimes people who try to point out based solely on the biological evidence that the reason reasonableness of design are lumped in with other groups and, and e more easily dismissed. So it's kind of a cultural inertia, I think, that explains most of it. Uh, what would be the ideas, uh, the meaning that you were trying to get into the title of your book, Darwin's Black Box? Okay, uh, uh, that's a good question. Black box is a phrase that's used in science to mean so, it, it's not like the airplane, uh, <laughs> airplane black box, it's, it's different. It means a, some system or a machine or something that does something wonderful, but you don't know how it works because you can't see inside of it. You don't know its parts. You don't know how it does. It's a black box. 
So if you had a box where you put in a scoop of dirt and out came a banana or something like that, uh, it would be wonderful, but it would be a black box. You didn't know how it worked. Well, to Darwin and his contemporaries, the cell was a black box. They thought it was a simple little piece of what they called protoplasm, essentially jello. Uh, and, but nonetheless, it did these wonderful things. But they were clueless about how it did it. Uh, but nonetheless, over the past century plus, science has figured out what's in that black box. And it's not simple at all. It's, it's ex extraordinarily complex. And mm -hmm. so that was the point of the book. Thank you, Professor. Uh, if I could play devil's advocate for a second, um, one of the common objections I have heard to intelligent design is the idea that it is infertile, i.e. that it closes off avenues of further scientific inquiry. How do you respond to this objection? Well, that's good, yeah. They say, uh, uh, you know, intelligent design, you know, you say God did it, you know, and then where do you go from there? Well, you can say a number of things. Uh, first of all, it's uh, the a point of a scientific theory is, is not to be fertile, it's to explain things. And any scientific theory that's proposed closes off other areas of approach. Uh, other theories, it says, it claims I, this theory is correct, those other theories are wrong. For example, suppose you thought you wanted to build a machine that traveled faster than the speed of light. Uh, and then Einstein proposed his idea and said nothing can travel faster than the speed of life, of light. You say, well, you know, that's, you know, that shuts off inquiry. You know, that, that shuts down debate. But what it does is positive. It points to where uh, research is likely to be fruitless and says avoid trying to make machines that go faster than light because you aren't going to succeed. Uh, intelligent design says avoid trying to spend a lot of time figuring out how random processes could build spectacularly intricate machinery because that's not going to work. It requires design. That being said, there's lots of things you can, uh, you can approach with a theory of design. You know, suppose that you traveled in a rocket ship and went down on an alien planet and you saw the remains of a civilization with all sorts of phenomenal machinery. You didn't know how it worked. Well, what would you do? Would you declare that it was, you know, just it, it randomly arose? Or would you try to figure out uh, the principles behind the machinery and, and learn from that? Design says that we can figure out, you know, uh, by understanding the machinery, uh, the design machinery, we can, you know, advance uh, our understanding of how to make things in our own world. Uh, you can also, you know, uh, come up with, uh, limits on things like uh, how far diseases might spread, how might, uh, we, we talked about Ebola a year or so ago, uh, and people said it was evolving, you know, how much can it evolve? You know, is it going to change a lot? It certainly changes a little bit, you know, but does it change a lot? It, it turns out that the Ebola virus basically is pretty much the same virus that's been around for thousands and thousands of years with minor tweaks here and there. Uh, a Darwinian theory would say, you know, that virus uh, and other comparably complex systems simply had to be produced by random processes. Therefore, evolution will always defeat our medicines, you know, so it's kind of a counsel of despair. But intelligent design says, no, there are limits on what unintelligent processes can do. So if we can devise medicines, drugs that can, uh, that can stop evolution in one step or two steps or three steps, we can, uh, we can productively you know, deal with problems like this. So um, I guess long and short is that uh, you know, there's lots of things that you can do with a theory of design, uh, but uh, folks on the other side aren't interested in, in thinking too hard about it because they want to promote their own ideas. Um, uh, but design says their ideas aren't going anywhere, and there's lots and lots of good experimental evidence uh, for that. Which, 
I don't have time to go into. Yes? I had mentioned earlier uh, our thanks to Father Edlifson and the St. Agnes Parish for opening the doors of the parish to Holy Transfiguration, or to, to, uh, to the Institute of Catholic Culture. So thank you, Father Edlifson, in the flesh. Uh, right. All right. And you won't find me anywhere else but in the flesh, because I, I, I have no experience of anything else. <laughs> I just wanted to ask you one question here, and pardon me for being a bit philosophical, but here, coming from the vantage point of Aristotle's various forms of causality, would it be fair to say that the, uh, the, the debate or the conflict between, say, the Cardinal Schoenborn approach, intelligent design, and the, uh, as you had the Nobel Prize, Nobel Prize approach here, those who are seeing, uh, you know, uh, an unsupervised, uh, you know, uh, change in things, um, that this really is a debate between those who would say we should limit science to ma or our understanding of things to material causality yes. versus those who would say, you know, such as Cardinal Schoenborn, to uh, let's open ourselves up to a formal causality. Yeah, I, I, think, I think that's exactly right. That, in fact, um, the scientists, the Nobelists, want to explain the world only in material causes. Uh, but that's got real problems because you go on, as many people have, to deny your own mind. Uh, so the Nobel laureates will have to explain their own minds uh, in, uh, in material terms, which essentially uh, changes them from minds to, to machinery. Uh, on the other hand, uh, Cardinal Schoenborn and our every all of our experience is that mind is a fundamental part of nature. And that's not because of a philosophical, you know, heavy philosophical deduction, it's our experience. You know, we see minds in operation all the time, and we know how to infer where minds have been operating. So the approach of Cardinal Schoenborn, and I think of the design uh, movement too, is an empirical one. What do we see operating in nature? What do we have experience of? Um, and the folks like the Nobelists, we have no experience of random processes being able to build sophisticated machinery. And I could go on for another uh, few hours citing modern experimental uh, evidence showing that is exactly the case. But no matter how much the evidence points in the other direction, if you, like they, start with the assumption that matter and energy is all there is, then you'll never get, you'll never see design. Uh, you'll, you'll essentially be uh, in a dark room and no light and, and uh, you won't be able to see what's, what's in there. Doctor, we have a question coming in from Rosario Riley, who is uh, very much involved in, in the education of our children, and the wife of Patrick Riley, who is the head of Cardinal Newman Society. Um, so they're watching online. Welcome. Um, she asks, could you please explain in a couple of sentences, maybe I'll grant you a paragraph or two, how we express the church's teaching on creation and evolution if you don't have the luxury of giving your talk or the other more in-depth talks that the Institute of Catholic Culture offers? What would I say to, to uh, somebody I met on the street? What is the church's teacher teaching? Uh, I would say that how life arose and, and uh, the history of life is, uh, is a fascinating question and it's open to interpretations, uh, but we have to realize and have to acknowledge that life is the work of God, uh, that, um, uh, that <clears throat> nature by itself does not produce life, it does not uh, produce anything. Uh, so I think that would be the bottom line uh, teaching of the church. For a much more in-depth uh, <laughs> in presentation, I can recommend a book by somebody not myself uh, <laughs> called Catholicism and Evolution, which was published just this year um, I forget the publisher, but it's written by Father Michael Chabarek, who is currently the chaplain at Thomas Aquinas College in California. And he looks at the church's official teachings on evolution uh, beginning in the 19th century and, and uh, all the way up through statements of Pope Francis.